Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, how was your sunshine today? I'm really happy to see you here. I don't need a full theater because what I have to share always is special for me to give to you. It's a gift. Um, this, hap this talk happens to be my favorite talk. I've been working on cruise ships for about 10 years now. Um, I did other things, was blessed with other things, and um, uh, with other com This is my first time with a Holland America, but um, whenever I would leave any port, you know, it was time to leave. That includes Antarctica, all of South America, the Norwegian fjords, Honigsvag, North Cape, all of the Mediterranean, you name it, Hawaii. But this is the only cruise for me personally that every afternoon on a Thursday afternoon like this, I feel really sad because I'm leaving Alaska. And I'm not lying to you. That is honestly the truth. It's a very strange thing. It captures you. I hope it captured you too. This talk is on explorers, but it's not about dates and times and figures and things. Yes, I will include that. But it is the story of Alaskan explorers. And towards the end, you will understand exactly how important that is. Well, we know that the first people that came here, they call themselves the first people. They came across from Siberia on what was called the Land Strait, the Bering Land Strait. In fact, every first people crossed this land strip would be the, all of them, the Navajos, the Mohawks, the Aztec, the Mayans, the Incas. They kept moving and moving and moving, and that is because of this land strike right here. Some stayed. Uh, many people say the ones that stayed, like our totem people, and some that live further north, the Aleuts, because there was something about for Alaska for them, but also the Aurora Borealis had, became something very spiritual. I will say that the Inupiat, who are called Eskimos, came later, and they came on boats. But the people that you have interacted with on this cruise, the Southeast First People, uh, came during this period. And what motivates any creature to keep moving? It is food. Or uh, in, in cases of, in many cases in history of different peoples, a desire for more land. For example, the Vikings. Eventually, it wasn't just the, you know, pilgering of the of the of anything. They needed the land, and so those things are the things that that make people move, make people go. And it's usually in this case, it is for the food. And let's face it, if you've had a chance to see any salmon or anything else, there's plenty of food for any kind of animal, including, including human beings who would live in this area. So this became a very important area for these people. It's believed that they came sometime between 16,000, the, the folks that we know now, that, that our first people came between the 16th and 16,000 BC. Um, the first written accounts of any other people coming here, indicating Europeans, as that might be, were the Russians. And that happened in 1648. Semyon um, he, he was sailing from the mouth of the Russian Kolyma River, and uh, he, he was in the Arctic Ocean, and he got lost, basically. And he went around the eastern tip of Asia, and it's what he thought was part of Asia, but he noticed that there was land to the east. And he talked about it. He was carried off course, and he was near the shores of Alaska. Uncharted territory. No one believed him, but the rumor went on for 75 years. Now, this man, Semyon, was not that re well respected because he was semi-literate and not considered part of the aristocracy or the aristocracy navy of Russia. And so, but they knew he had something there. So, in 1725, Russians called for an expedition to answer once and for all if Siberia was in fact connected to this other land. 
all of the other European countries had made their footprints in this thing we call the New World, not just in North America and South America, but in Asia. And we know the stories of the history of the movement of all those in Western Europe moving in. But Russia had not made, a, 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 as they called themselves, a footprint, a colonial footprint. So they thought, okay, this may be our last chance, so let's see what's going on. The first voyage was in 1748. And that's Zemian going off, off course. They asked a man named Vitus Bering to try and get over there. What is that? What is that thing that man saw 75 years ago? Well, he rounded that East Cape and he headed uh, kind of southward toward the Kamchka Peninsula. And he did see land to the east. He tried to send some ships, but the weather was terrible. So he gave up and returned to St. Petersburg, Russia in 1730. Look at this map. Detailed Russia and Siberia. To the down the bottom, well, we see that cities are marked there and there's some mountains there. And Remember, this is the 1700s. That, what's that blob up above? That's Alaska. They had no clue. That's what they thought it might look like. They weren't sure if it was connected. They had no idea. And as you notice, there's not even any Aleutian Islands there. They had no idea. So this is an example of one of the maps that was available for anyone who was going to go out and explore. And of course, this one could never be used because it really had no, no one had gone there. So the people of Russia decided they would have the great northern expedition. Again, it was their last chance to make a footprint in the colonial world. It took 3,000 people directly or indirectly, and it cost 1.5 million rubles, which is a lot of money. It's about one-sixth of the Russian economy. Two ships left. It was in 1741. Of course, one was with Vitas. And uh, Bering had the ship called the St. Peter, and Alexei Shirikov had the St. Paul. In 1741, they both sailed. Six days later, they lost each other in a fog. I guess we've seen a lot of fog where we've been lately, haven't we? So, we know. But they both continued to sail east. Shirikov was the first to land. He saw what we th where we think is now the Prince of Wales Island. Oh, that's further north. He sent a group ashore in a longboat and making them the first actual Europeans to be documented standing in Alaska, we think. However, they did not return. So, he sent a second group, and they vanished. So having no more boats to send ashore, Shirikov lifted anchor and went back to Russia. Then it was Bering's turn. He was going to try his luck. He wound up finding a towering peak in Alaska near the Hubbard Glacier, and he named it Mount St. Elias. He, he wound up putting up a shore on the island of Kayak Island, and it was this made him the first Russian ever documented actually interacting with native people, and those native people were the Aleuts. Now here's a drawing that one of the mates made. They really loved their boats. They wrote a lot about how amazing their canoes were. Well, Bering did not want to stay and make friends. He had been on this expedition, expedition for eight years. He was ready to get home. But unfortunately for him, he never made it. He, his ship was wrecked on an island. Eventually, it was to become Bering Island, but this island... He would fall ill with scurvy and die in the December of, of 1741. The stranded crew who was left after the end of the winter, which was very difficult, was about 46 survivors. They built a boat about 40 feet long, and they sailed back to Russia in the summer of 1742. However, one man that did live was Georg Wilhelm Settler, who was a naturalist who happened to be on uh, Bering's boat. All, B 
This man, Stellar, made sure that all of the notes, everything that had been documented, would, would not be thrown away. He kept the journal, and Baring kept a journal, and he made sure that it was printed, and he was, that was amazing, and uh, it just one of those quirks of fate that he survived and was able to take those notes and begin to tell the world about this place that we now call Alaska. He ensured that Baring's charts and notes were published, it's in this book, which of course is in Russian there, he described the many landmarks that now bear the name of Bering, like Bering Strait, the Bering Island where they, were, they shipwrecked and Bering passed, and the Bering Sea, which if you watch TV shows like Deadliest Catch and the ships are going up and down and they're out in the ice, that is the Bering Sea, way up north. And, of course, this island where Bering lost his life. And during the short time they spent in Alaska, Steller was really the first naturalist to describe a number of North America plants and animals. And a lot of them bear his name, like the Steller J. Now, there's a thing about Steller, as all naturalists, he really loved snails. Well, somebody's got to love them, because they've got to write about them. So he was an expert on snails, or became the expert on snails, and he is noted for that. And because he discovered these animals and these shells and the nature of every snail that is found now, that has been found from that 1700s until whenever to the future, uh, every snail in tide pools from California on the west coast all the way up to Alaska, always, all of them have a scientific name that begins with the word Beringius, B-E-R-I-N-G-I-U-S, Bering, Beringius. Well, Steller did more than just look at snails. He introduced us, as well as working with the first people, to document some very unique lifestyles. Now, you're going to see, this is from his publication called The Beast of the Sea. Now, you'll see the folk, that the animals on the right, on the, excuse me, the left-hand side, they look pretty familiar. Those are s seals. But what's that thing on the other side? Stellar described it as this. These animals, I'm referring to the one on the right-hand side, that is, they live in herds. During the eating, they move the head and neck like an ox, then lift the head out of the water and draw fresh breath with a rasping and snorting sound after the manner of horses. Stellar called it a sea cow. It came to be known as the Stellar Sea Cow. This huge manatee, a manatee, used to live in Alaska waters, and I say used to. It was the size of a small whale, and they were vegetarians, very docile, just like the manatees that are in Florida. Some of the last ones left are extremely gentle mammal creatures. Unfortunately for them, they were very tasty. They were slow, very slow and easily hunted. By 1768, only 27 years after their initial discovery by the Europeans, the last of their kind, the stellar sea cow, was harvested. The history of the stellar sea cow is one of the shortest periods that a large mammal has been known in science. This animal no longer exists on this planet. Stellar's legacy does live on, though, with what I hope you got to see on this cruise, this fabulous stellar sea lion. They serve as an appropriate symbol of this first naturalist in the region. Uh, did anybody ever get to see any of them or have them pointed out to you by naturalists? They're amazing. And if you came to my talk about mammals and animals and stuff, you saw photographs of how huge they are. There were, they're amazing creatures, and th they got his name. The published journals of Stellar and Bering made possible future explorations of Alaska. But truly, it was the crew who brought back something that sparked the world of the beginning of Alaska, the little sea otter. Usually about the size of a seven-year-old, weighs about 70 to 90 pounds. You, did anybody see these? 
You go on tours and see these? I love these. They're my favorite animal. Well, why would this animal make such a big difference? Because their pelts, if you heard me talk about the pelts or you saw the pelts when the rangers were here, they don't have blubber. They don't have fat. What they have is fur. The thumb thing is if you put the thumb on the pelt, that is a million hairs. So this was luxurious fur and it was something those traders in Russia wanted. We're going to make some money off of this. And so they brought back those pelts and Russia said, all right, we're going to take over. They sent trading posts to Kodiak Island where most of eventually all the sea otters were gone. They went to another place and eventually it was in Sitka that they set up their headquarters. And um, they made lots of money. The Russian American company was formed. When I say America, it had nothing to do with the United States of America. It, it, that's just what they called it. And they hunted them to the point of extinction. Plus, it was extremely expensive to send supplies from Russia to Sitka. So in about 1860, the Tsar and those in charge of the economy said, we need to, this, we're going to cut this off. We have no more money. The sea otters are almost gone. Let's sell this land. Well, it would make sense that the Russians would perhaps sell the land to Great Britain because there's Canada. However, there's a little thing, a word that's popped up in our news in the last year or so, but it was Crimea. It was the Crimean War that prevented the Russians from even offering a bid to Great Britain because they had fought in the Crimea. So in 1860, the Tsar and the powers that be in Russia came to the United States and said, would you like to buy this piece of land? Well, there was a problem. 1860, Abraham Lincoln had just been elected and South Carolina had just seceded from the Union. So they were not interested in, a, in something so far away. But the Russians were persistent. In 1867, they approached the United States again. And at this point, William Henry Seward said, yes, we will buy it. So they paid $7.2 million, or two cents an acre, for Alaska. In reality, the land, they only paid $2 million for the land. The rest of it was to pay for military hardware that the United States had purchased from Russia during the Civil War. I'm going to go a little bit further than that in just a minute. But there were Europeans who came to this area before Russia, but they didn't stay for any reason. The Spanish came, Juan Perez, the uh, King Charles. There were many, many expeditions, like from 1775 to 1791. In fact, the Spains, Spanish was allocated the right to colonize anything on the west coast of North America. That's because we go back in history, I'm not going to go into the detail, of, of, of Mexico and moving the land and California and all that. You, you know all that, and it's not important in history except for the fact that the Spanish did come up here, but really all they did was name things. No one ever stayed. They came around and they, and they would name this or that, but they never really did minute map detailing, uh, just enough for what they needed. These expeditions that they had did do one thing, though. They named some amazing places. This was in, 18, in 1819, too. They really withdrew in 1819. But between this time period, they, they named the town of Valdez, which we know from the Valdez 1989 oil spill, and the beautiful Maraspina Glacier, all further up north. Of course, the San Juan Islands that are near Puget Sound that we go through. There's a lot of things that are named, have Spanish words, but the Spanish never stayed there. And they knew that they could not, uh, get that King Charles of Spain knew there's no way they could maintain anything up there. So they basically made a deal with the U.S. in, in that time for a period of 1819, and they transferred the land to the United States. And then there was the British. You've heard of Captain Cook. There's no one that travels on a cruise ship or anywhere on water today on certain areas that cannot know that they are traveling the same area that Captain Cook did. He traveled the world. That's just an example of some of the places that he went and things that he discovered. Um, 
he came into this area. He was looking to, uh, to do many things, uh, but in particular, he wanted to see the world and see what was out there and answer a lot of questions. In uh, 1778, he sailed along the west coast of, of North America, and he discovered way up north what would be called um, the uh, Cook Inlet. That's near Homer, way up north. The interesting thing is this. Before he came here, he went to an area on a big island that he had never seen before. And these people greeted him because it happened to be the time of the celebration of one of their gods. So, of course, he was welcomed like a god, treated like a god. It happened to be Hawaii, the big island south of Kona, which he called the Sandwich Islands after his friend, the Earl of Sandwich. Well, to say the least, they had a really good time. But at one point... Cook knew it's time to go, and he wanted to go further north, so he did take the ship. He had a, a few ships, but the one big ship. He went up north. It was a bad time of the year. He could not get through the Bering Strait, and so they all made the decision. I guess the conversation must have gone something like, wow, we had a good time where we were before. Let's just go down there a little bit longer and then maybe try doing this again, which is what they did. Unfortunately, the time of worshipping the god that the Hawaiians thought was a god, that period was over. And they were so shocked and there was so, so much chaos that in that chaos, Captain Cook was killed. There is a monument to him south of Kona in the area where they believe it happened. But his junior officers were able to get away. Many of those junior officers included a man named Vancouver and others and they were able to get back to Great, Great Britain keep all the treasures and all of the stuff that he had, uh, n notes, documents, journals, everything. It was brought back to England and they all were hailed as heroes to being able to sail back to England and keep everything steady. So one of those officers, junior officers, was a man named George Vancouver and the other was a man named William Bly, who was given the ship the HMS Bounty. And I guess we know the rest is history. True story. Mutiny on the Bounty. Well, right after that, George Vancouver, who had also traveled with Cook, was given his own ship, the HMS Discovery, and his mission was to discover, they said, okay, you're going to discover the western entrance to the Northwest Passage. The problem is there is no Northwest Passage. Never has been, never will be. And he basically was able to prove that there wasn't. So when he realized that, he set about doing the thing that he did best. And that was taking minute details of everything, everywhere he went. Anybody go to Misty Fjord today? Okay. Did you see that big island with the, with the kind of funky rock, Rockaway? He, he named that. He came through this area. Glacier Bay. When he came through Glacier Bay, he... He documented that as he went past Glacier Bay, where we call Icy Straits, there was a wall of ice 250 feet high. He could, there was no Glacier Bay, but he not documented, documented this ice wall. Remember, it was in the 1700s, going up into the 18. Vancouver went on to document the greatest maps that have ever been known for Alaska. So, so perfect in detail. He didn't miss anything. More than anyone, and this is the beginning of those maps. Of course, there's more, but this is just an example of one of the first ones. More than anyone else, it is, in his, it is his shadow that we sail through this inside passage. Is because of him that we are here and following in his footsteps, so to speak. We know a lot of ships are coming in and out, especially in, in the summertime, but it is because of a man named George Vancouver. It was the beginning, not the end, but the beginning. He named things like Tracy Arm, 
which if you had the chance, it's a little south of Juneau, you may have taken that tour into Tracy Arm that leads to Sawyer Glacier. Also, Holcomb Bay, Icy Strait, like I said, there was a wall there, but he named it, Lynn Canal, all of these are in the Juneau area, and Mount Etchcombe that I'd mentioned when we talked about volcanoes, that's right outside of Sitka, and the, the lady that saw Misty Fjords, that rock is called New Eddystone Rock near Ketchikan. That's it right there on the right. Amazing. And like most of the West Coast explorers, he died young. But George Vancouver left his name, not that he gave his name, but his name was given to not only the city of Vancouver, but the island of Vancouver, on the tip of which is Victoria, and I'll be talking about Victoria tomorrow because we're getting ready to go down there. We'll go there uh, tomorrow evening. Like a lot of explorers of the west coast areas or the areas that are far away from their home of England or wherever they're from, they died young. He, he died at the age of 40. This is his modest grave in England. It's a stark contrast to the legacy that he left the world. It's impossible to travel in this area, whether in the Pacific, Northwest, or Canada, without seeing somebody made a statue in honor of him. One of the most famous statues, which you will get to see, it won't be that close unless you've got a telescopic lens, but this is a statue of George Vancouver in gold on top of the Victoria British Columbia Legislative Building. And uh, to honor him. So now we're at the Alaska Purchase. I mentioned Russia didn't want to go to England because of the Crimean War. In 1867, the U.S. said, sure, we'll buy it. 7.2 million. Well, to say the least, the U.S. And, and was not happy about that. The people. They just finished a civil war. If you take the percentage of men who died to the population in 1865, to the pop percentage of young men today, seven million young men were killed from 1861 to 1865. To say the least, there were a lot of people that were not happy. They were trying to rebuild their country, whether north or south. Plus, they were trying to expand to the west. So, they called it Seward's Folly. Alaska was called Seward's Icebox. And I suppose Seward, in the long run, if he was alive today, would go, ha ha, the last, last laugh is on you. That is a picture of the check. Yes, they wrote checks. And that is a picture of the check for the $7 million, $7.2 million. Seward there, kind of a big guy, Secretary of State with the staff. This was in 1867. In 1869, he actually came to Sitka. If you had a chance, or you, perhaps you knew already, from where we stood on the, um, wh where you come off the tender and there's the flat area where all the people are all, if you looked up, that was called Castle Hill. There was a governor's house there at one time, but many decades later it burned. But it is there that the, that the papers were finally, fi everything was finalized in 1869 between the Russians and the Americans. Now, anybody go to the Saxman village today? Okay. Did you see this? You see, didn't tell you. No. The, I, I'm, I'm repeating this because the man back said it fell over. That is very weird. Well, the, the tradition is if a, a, the tradition of t totem poles falling is that if they fall, there is a reason and you do not move it. You, I know, I know, I know. Thank you for sharing that. Well, let me tell you the story then. After they signed the papers, the, the chief or the leader of the Clinkets had a party to honor Seward. And in a, it's called a potlatch. And in the potlatch, you bring all of anything that's important. Everybody brings it. Just like if you go to, to somebody's house and you bring your casserole or a bottle of wine or whatever. But you bring the best. 
Seward brought nothing, and he was the honored guest, and that is the person that is supposed to bring it. So what happened was, the chief and the leaders of the time said, we are going to build a pole of shame. That is William Henry Seward with big red ears and a big nose to shame the man who did not honor the first people's customs. And it fell last week. Wow. I don't know what to say about that, but... Mm. Yeah, they can rebuild it. Yeah, and, and if you go there, did, uh, in, the, in, in the building area, did you see Mr. Jackson, Nathan Jackson, cutting totem poles? Okay, Nathan Jackson, that is his cutting shop. Um, of course, 23% of Ketchikan is Clinket and uh, some Haida, and there's the Shimshians. Mr. Nathan Jackson is called a master crafter. He does not like to be called that. He is a very quiet man. He is the wor world's most famous totem carver. He has taught all the young people. There was a time when they were not allowed to speak their language or do their carving or their basket weaving, nothing. But those days have changed. His work is in the S Smithsonian Institute. So... If anybody's going to build a good one and put it up, it'll be him and his son and his grandson that do that. So, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Then we start the beginning of what's the, the beginning of what we know as Alaska today. There was a young Scottish immigrant named John Muir. He was a naturalist. He was not a geologist. He was a naturalist. He loved Yellowstone National Park and he started a club of conservation called the Sierra Club for anyone that wanted to be a part of it to change this great world. It is one of the most famous and largest grassroots environmental organizations in the United States and in the world. If you read there, this is it. And this was written in the late 1800s. The Sierra Club's mission is to explore, enjoy, and protect the wild places of the earth to practice and promote the responsible use, use of the earth's ecosystems and resources to educate and enlist humanity to protect and restore the quality of the natural and human environment and to use all lawful means to carry out these objectives. John Muir's Sierra Club marked the beginning of what we know now as Alaska conservation and all that we need to do to protect it. Why did he do it then? Not just because he happened to be alive then. Because we have to remember that this great United States was great because of a lot of people who took lots of risks that brought millions of immigrants to this country. And what did those people do? They built railroads across this nation. They tore up the land. They didn't care about it. this was the last living area for a certain animal. It, it wasn't their worry. It was their manifest destiny to go across and do whatever. And they did it and they succeeded. But these people also had no use for people like John Muir who wanted to protect certain areas. And so this movement of thought started. And John Muir did it. And surprisingly, it started in the Yosemite Valley National Park. Well, the park then. It wasn't even a park. Yosemite Valley. He loved this. This area. He hadn't been to Alaska yet. But he noticed, as those of you that went to the misty fjords today, there's no water there, but there's the huge granite cliffs with striations on them. And he knew that this was because glaciers had moved through that area. And he wanted to prove it. The geologists that were educated at the time said he was ridiculous. But there were a few that did believe him. And then he had a chance uh, to go to Alaska to observe other glaciers. So he went to Wrangell. He, got f he was with a, a, a minister and five Clinkin Indians. And they went through the waters from Wrangell, 250 miles in October, to try to go to this area where they, where they could find, they'd been told there were glaciers. Well, he gets to Icy Strait and he's looking at the map that Vancouver wrote and it's supposed to be a 250 foot ice wall and is totally open. So they go in. And there he discovers 
lots and lots of glaciers. Glaciers move, as you heard from me and also from your rangers. This is what Glacier Bay looked like. I'm um, excuse me, John Muir Glacier, named after him, at one time, and here's the movement of it. That's a little cabin that he built, and this is what's interesting. Muir was a wonderful writer, and he went to Alaska five different times, and every t everything he wrote and documented, he would send to the San Francisco Examiner, and they would send it out by telegraph to all these newspapers all over the United States and the world, and suddenly people want to hear about this. What's this place? What is this place? You got to go to Glacier Bay. His book, Travels in Alaska, is still available. They were selling it, the uh, geographic people were selling it on, on, on board. But I'm telling you right now, if you've got a Kindle, you can get it free. I did. And his writing is so remarkable that everyday people like you and I can understand it. But if you were a scientist or a geologist or a climatologist, you'd get it too and you'd enjoy it. It is still being read today. An amazing man who believed in nature, conservation, and discovery. Marvelous books. Marvelous thoughts. He was a big influence. All those writings. And in fact, he, he inspired a man named John Harriman. He was one of the richest men in the world at the time. Edward, Edward Harriman, I'm sorry. And he basically created the first cruise to Alaska. He gathered some of the greatest minds of the day, greatest scientists, and he, as the owner of the Union Pacific and the Southern Pacific Railroad, he was so inspired by Muir's stories that he wanted to go up there, so he got the best steamship he could find, got these people on board, and had the first cruise to Alaska. This was a great public relations move for Alaska. Through the photographs of Edward Curtis, the paintings of Louis Fuertes, and the words of one of the great naturalist writers of the time, John Burroughs, Alaska was brought into the spotlight of the world all over. The Harriman series that you see here was written not just by Harriman, but also, of course, John Muir together. They wrote this. It, there were 14 volumes. They hired several scientists to write volumes on different animals. 14 volumes took 17 years to publish, and it's still being used today by scientists. So, while naturalists and scientists and others were enjoying it, suddenly, there you go. Gold, 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 gold. That's what all the newspapers said. There had been other gold rushes, but this was a big one. When the ship came down from the Alaska area into Seattle, there was, I think, approximately anywhere from 80 to $92 million worth of gold that these people had found. And you can bet your bottom dollar that everybody wanted to go and find the gold. The gold rush was on. Now the deal with this was that the, a lot of the bulk of the gold initially was in an area that was, there weren't real borders yet. So it was kind of like the Yukon and Dawson City, but then also there was gold found all the way down to here, all along this area. But there had been no real borders. So the Royal Can Canadian Mounted Police took it upon themselves to say, if you want to come into what we believe is Canada to come look for gold, you must have one year's worth of supplies, which is about 2,000 pounds, say 50 pounds of bacon. Something that you, you will have to be able to prove that you can. So these people did that walk. Now, there are three different parts of that walk. This is the one that takes you up. But you can't put 2,000 pounds of, on your back. So they had to make it several times. Can you imagine? And at the top of the mountain, there'd be seven or eight Royal Canadian, Canadian Mounted Police who I love. I think they're great. They stood right there and said, tell us what you've got. Put your stuff here you know, blah, 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 and then when you get back and we know the rest of the Klondike story. Interesting fact, though. When the powers that be decided to, to actually put the border line between Canada 
and Alaska. This is before it was a state. They said to Canada, well, you decided to stay at the top of the mountain. That's where you stopped people. You didn't bother to go down to the bottom. So the borderline's going to be right up here. And that's why we don't go to Juneau, Canada, Ketchikan, Canada, or Sitka, Canada. Because the Mounties never moved from the top of that mountain. A lot of people didn't make much money, only a handful did. But those that stayed were the ones that wrote the stories home. And they loved Alaska. It influenced a lot of people. Like this man, Jack London, the writer of Call of the Wild, White Fang, and many others. How many of you remember when you perhaps were a child and you read Call of the Wild? If you have not read it, get it. If you have a Kindle, it's 99 cents. I remember my father taking me to the public library and pulling a book out and saying, I was about nine years old, Linda, you need to read this. This is a great book. Okay, Daddy, I'll read this book. It was about this place called Alaska. And that's the first time I ever wondered, what's it like in Alaska? Wow. Not only was there men like Jack London, one of America's greatest poets, tried to be a stampeder. He was a stampeder. That's what they call themselves. He wrote many, many poems, but the one that's called the Songs of a Sourdough is one of the more popular ones. He was one of America's greatest, greatest poets. And, and his trip to Alaska and the Klondike area uh, really changed his life. I want to read just one little verse. He was on a beach somewhere in Alaska, and he picked up a little piece of sand, and he put it in his hand. And, he, and he, at late, years later, he remembered it and wrote this. For look within my hollow hand while round the earth careens, I hold a single grain of sand and wonder what it means. Ah, if I had the eyes to see and a brain to understand, I think life's mysteries might be found in this little grain of sand. If you don't know that one, I know you know this one because I studied this in high school and I bet you did too. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic tales have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Anybody remember that one from high school? Yeah. Great poetry. He was a stampeder. Someone else that was a stampeder. A man named Nordstrom. He didn't make any money. He sold what little he had, took back, opened a shoe shop in Seattle, and the rest is history. Ladies who like shoes know Nordstrom's. Right, ladies? Yep, Mr. Nordstrom. Okay. He was one of them too. But here's something that begins the true story now. We're transferring. We, we've gone from the Russians and we've moved forward, okay? Now we're in the 1900s. This is a period of time that was so important for Alaska. This lady, they called her Marty. Marty Murray. She came at a very critical time. Born in Seattle, when she was a little girl, her family moved to Alaska in Anchorage. Her father had worked for the government. This area was, of course, still a territory. She was a true trailblazer. She was amazing. She was the first woman to graduate from the University of Alaska. And to describe her as unique is an understatement. She could talk to Congress as well as she could count reindeer and caribou on a large field. It was all the same to her. It was a passion. Everything in her life was a passion. She married Olas, 
in 1924. He, he in himself was a famous biologist and one who did studies on animals. And together, what a team. They loved each other. They went everywhere. They had three children. When they went up way past Nome to do whatever the studies were, there are photographs of them with their three children and one baby with all this netting because there's lots of bugs way up there. So the, they're all covered in and she's got the baby on the backpack and they're going on the dog sledding in the winter because she believed in this area. She believed it and she loved her husband and she wasn't just a wife, she was his friend and they did it all together. In, eight, in 1956, they began a campaign, a very important campaign. Their project was to save or try and get Congress to do something. And that was to protect an area they called the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. In her first speech, and she made many, her first speech in the 1950s when Eisenhower was the president said this, I am testifying as an emotional woman and I would like to ask you gentlemen, remember there are no women in Congress then, I would like to ask you gentlemen, what's wrong with emotion? Beauty is a resource in and of itself. Um, Alaska must be allowed to be Alaska. That is her greatest economy. I hope that the United States of America is not so rich that she can afford to let these wildernesses just pass by and not so poor that she cannot afford to keep them. Well, needless to say, they listened to her. And she helped at that point America save 8 million acres set aside of what we call the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This was in the 50s and later on today there are 19 million acres that are part of that national refuge. Eisenhower was not the only man to listen to her, our president. Every president subsequent afterwards wanted her advice, sought her and her husband Olus's advice on the wildernesses and on conservation of whatever the territory was that they were talking about. The last president to speak with her was Bill Clinton. In fact, Clinton awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. It is the highest honor that can be given to an American civilian. She didn't seek publicity. She loved the land, any land. She just wanted all of us to be aware of it. Clinton says this about her at that time. She became, Marty became, the prime mover in the creation of one of America's greatest national treasures. And she has blazed trails for generations of conservationists in the future. That's all of us. Marty died on October 19th, 2003 at the age of 101, but her legend in Alaska lives on and beyond. She truly brought Alaska into the modern age. It was her, the silent woman who could speak to Congress, but could make things happen. We don't read about her in history books, but she was there. And she, it's because of her that our lands are now wildernesses. 50 years ago now, this year, President Johnson signed the Wilderness Protection Act, which doesn't include just Alaska. It includes wildernesses all over the United States. And you have an opportunity, if you look it up on Google or ask other folks wherever you live, hey, let's go visit a wilderness near us because it's the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Wilderness Protection Act. So go to the maps, go look and find and see if you can find your own wilderness. 56% of Alaska is protected because of the work of the conservations, conservationists and in particular, Marty. Now, the wilderness is amazing. Change a little bit here. You may or may not have heard of a man named Christopher McCandless. 
He left the conventions of modern society and he hiked into the Alaska wilderness with a very little food and equipment. It was suicide. His 1992 disappearance led author John Krakauer to investigate and write the book Into the Wild, which was followed by a movie in 2007. True story. Interesting book. I talk to park rangers a lot, and I've asked several of them about this thing called the McCandless Phenomenon. It's where young people come to Alaska to challenge themselves against an unforgiving wilderness where the possibilities of rescue are remote at best. Krakauer is the first to say that they are not really arrogant. They actually have an overwhelming desire to be the first to explore some blank space on Earth. But there are no more blank spaces. We know they're there. There may be mountains un unnamed, but we know they're there. This desire to travel to unknown and uncharted areas is a basic human instinct that you and I have. How many of you have been to Alaska before? Look at those hands. That's why every Thursday afternoon I get sad. I'm leaving Alaska. I'm even sadder now because I'll be leaving on Saturday with you to go on vacation and my contract's over. And I'll go, oh, it's my last Alaska. That human desire to see something that perhaps no one else has seen. To feel something. Did you somewhere along this, tr this week... Don't answer, just rhetorical question. Did you somewhere, but in this cathedral of Mother Nature, wherever you went on a tour or into Glacier Bay or saw some animals that took your breath away, did you suddenly feel very small? Not because the mountains are sm big, but suddenly the real you is right there. Not, no, no health worries, no worries about money, no worries of anything. It's the real you, no ego. The real you that first time you ever saw a lightning bug, that feeling. Or the first time you walked in a creek. Or maybe the first time you ever saw a mountain. Or maybe the first time you saw the ocean. There was no words to describe it. There was just this, wow. That childlike wonder still remains in you. And that's why people come back and back and back. Because it reminds them that they didn't lose it. It's still there. And that's why Alaska is one of the most, that among many things, is one of the most repeated cruises of all cruises ever existed. I, when I walk off this ship on Saturday, Alaska will be going with me. I'm not talking about photographs and anything. Alaska is in my heart now. And I've had the chance to do this for 16 weeks. So you can imagine. I hope that has happened for you. I hope that you've been able to find a place of peace and serenity where nothing can hurt you. It's all just right there. This wilderness, this land that you know will never be destroyed. That is protected. The one of the few places in the world left that no one, when you come back, you know you're going to see it the same thing. We all are out there struggling. But the struggle's not so bad. We know change happens. We adjust to change. So does Mother Nature. We've seen that throughout the week. Alaska is an amazing state, and you've only seen part of it. Of course, it became a state in 1859. Hall of America will take you further if you want to someday. I hope you took a picture of a license plate, because I really like these license plates. The last frontier, and guess what it really is. From Mount McKinley to the barren lands, all of us, cruise ship passengers, lumberjacks, girls who cook, ladies that cook the crab, look, you see them all, panning for gold, the guy that takes care of the baby bears and the wolverines. All together we are Alaska. Whether it was the first people, the Russians, G George Vancouver, John Muir, Harriman, the Murdys, the Robert Cerf's services, the Jack London's of the world, the Nordstrom's of the world, guess what? We are all Alaskan explorers. There's Cook and the Murdys. The memories. 
the walking through the timber forest, seeing that spruce tree, such a special tree you don't see very often, and the glaciers. And proudly to say, Holland America opens her bow to you. Yes, we are all Alaska explorers. It hasn't ended. It continues. Not only are we all Alaska explorers, we are pilgrims of this world. I'm going to show you some photographs for last minute memories, perhaps. Take all of this back with you and come back to Alaska. Alaska will always belong to you. Thank you. <laughs>